I'm Barnaby Brown and in this video I'm going to be um, examining a, uh, a pair of reeds made by Max Brumberg um, and finished by Melinda Maxwell. And um, I'm uh, visiting Melinda um, at the moment and uh, it's been an absolute joy after uh, two years of not being able to uh, visit people and, and, and exchange instruments and, and play people's reeds. Uh, suddenly I've learned so much today and these reeds um, I say made by Max Brunberg and parented by Melinda because um, in fact um, one of them one of them split Max sent a replacement and Melinda has been gingerly over the last two years uh, a bit of scraping, a bit of, of gentle sandpapering inside, uh, plenty of soaking in oil, uh, just gradually parenting these reeds, um, raising them, and she's done the most wonderful job. Well, both Max in the making and Melinda in the parenting. And I'm just making this video uh, to demonstrate, uh, um, to celebrate um, a fabulous team effort um, and to share with everybody um, what I want an Aulos reed to do, or Louvre Aulos reeds to do at this moment, okay, this is not definitive at all, um, we're all on a, a learning journey, uh, but I also want to document for Melinda what my lips can do on her reeds, because that's a very different thing to what her lips can do, or anybody else's lips can do. Um, because what 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 the, the sound that comes out is so much more about about the player than about the object the the, the pipe uh, and the reed. You know the pipe has very little to do with it. The reed has quite a lot to do with it, and the player has everything to do with it. So let's go. Um, I'm not familiar with these reeds at all, but I've I've had about ten fifteen minutes of getting to know them and. Um, and figuring out which one I like in which pipe and which way around I like them uh, because no reed is is symmetrical so um, I I've played around and this is this is for me optimal The first thing I love about these compared with what I'm used to is that I'm not having to do any jiggery pokery in and out with the arm to tune them. They're just in tune straight off. Oh, I'm not used to that. Okay, this is a new sensation for me. Completely uh, uh, um, delightful and exciting. Um, so this, I just feel this is the way to go, okay? There's much less um, complication. Um, and I'm going to use that technique of cuts and strikes in order to not fool myself. Uh, 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 about the intonation. So here we go with some cuts and strikes on the top, on the on the low pipe first. So I'm playing as short as I can, so I, so the, I can't possibly uh, change the intonation with my support or with my um, embouchure. Okay. Also loving the synchrony. Oh, it's five o'clock. Tea time. Now, the way in which the two pipes become one is magical. Okay, the 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 blend between the two reeds is really something to cultivate. You want the two pipes to stop being two and to become one, uh, so that you can do these effects. Those were those were cuts. I'll now do some strikes from a unison. And if I go up to the thumb, to go in and out with my lip. Wow. And one note higher. I want that to sound just like one 
you know, it, it, so, so the low pipe is just disappearing. Super. Okay, so all these notes, both as cuts and strikes, uh, and I'm doing those cuts and strikes, I'm not fooling myself into thinking a pipe's in tune when it's not. Okay? Uh, um, those cuts and strikes, making them as short as possible, um, is for me the essential approach when you're testing a reed. You have to begin with cuts and strikes. Otherwise, you can't tell anything. You could be pushing it into tune uh, without realizing. Uh, so now, let's go with a high pipe. Again, cuts and strikes. Oh, that's actually a fourth. Liking those, so those are those are cuts. And those are strikes. Go one note higher. So it's quite raucous up there. Okay, that's my only only thing that I'm not totally happy with these reads about. I have to when it's raucous on the top note, more surface area. Okay, it's great having having these long long reads. I can really spread out the wet part of my uh, uh, part of my embouchure. So more surface area. So if you've got a raucous sound or it's a bit kind of uh, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> rough, uh, then more surface area, more compression. And with that kind of grip on the reed, more, more, m m more area, I've, I'm able to sort of uh, mollify, sweeten. <laughs> These are the best reeds I've played. These are the best Louvre Aronoff reeds I've played. They're better than my ones. Melinda, you're a lucky lady. Okay, you've done a fine job. Max, you've done a fine job. Uh, these are made in uh, Arunda Donax. So this is this is before the the, the Phragmites revolution. Okay, we're now learning about Phragmites. But as far as Arundo Donax reeds concerned, these are the bee's knees. Now. Um, um, let's just let's just put them through through their paces a little bit further. Um, one of the reasons that, that I'm also uh, uh, so enamoured um, um, of these reeds is the second register. Okay, so the reeds I've been playing don't really allow uh, uh, um, your your uh, to go through uh, um, an octave and a fifth higher, um, and these really do. It's gorgeous. I just because this is new to me I want to I want to do that all day I want to spend hours and hours practicing that upper register it's really really exciting I'm being able to I, I want to practice leaping from 
uh, the low register to the second register. Um, um, oh, I've never done this before. Totally new to me. Yeah. Okay. A bit raucous. I won't inflict more of the of the top register, but th you know this is clearly going to work. Okay. This is this. We're, we're in the land of, of of an exciting place where I can completely understand why the Louvre does not have syrinx holes. Okay. You can just flip up to the next register with with your embouchure. You don't need syrinx holes. Uh, obviously, it needs to be practiced. Okay. Here I am uh, uh, demonstrating something that I have not practiced. Okay. So you need to just imagine what I've just done, and then a million times better than that, okay? Put in 2,000 hours of, of, of register work um, and, and you'll be able to do amazing things, the sorts of things that would win our lost competitions in the sixth century BC. Okay, so now let's just, I'll just do a little bit of playing just to sort of show, show what these reads enable me to do. Important to think about circular breathing, okay? So um, they're, they're quite high pressure, which is lovely, all right? There's more, there's more back pressure. They, they're playing at a higher pressure than, um, uh, than a lot of people would immediately be able to circular breathe. So you've got that, that requires a bit of training. But really, you know, that's efficient. That, I'm totally happy with that from the circular breathing point of view. to circular breathe. <laughs> the good old thumb. Oh, um, that, there's been a lot of practice over the years on that thumb, but it still feels a lot less uh, um, agile. I love most about these reeds is the blend. The way that, that, that when you come to a unison, it totally becomes one, um, which allows you to, to create the sensation of silence. Um, So there I did a, a kind of gradual shift from doing, from doing strikes, really short strikes, slightly longer strikes, kind of even, and then ending with cuts, and then really short cuts. And that kind of practice, uh, um, um, I think is really important because that, that, that nuance, being able to go from the very, very shortest strike to the very, very shortest cut. I think it's a, a lovely thing to do. Now, just to finish off, let's see how we are with the uh, um, timbre transitions or, or pitch bends. Um. These are reeds that are clearly designed to be stable, okay? Uh, uh, so they don't give you as much of a pitch 
window as I'm used to. Uh, although they're very long, that seems counterintuitive, but no, these are, these are pitch stable reeds. I'm really struggling to do to be able to do a timbral transition. All right, so I'm used to playing reeds that clearly have a bigger pitch window, more flexible. So I would call these reeds um, aplastos. Okay, these are the sorts of reeds that that are for the noble older style, where you don't have so much pitch flexibility, where you end up doing where 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 you deliver um, a tetrachord and out it, it, out, um, it comes out enharmonic. Now, if you were to replace these reeds with more pitch flexible ones, you'd do exactly the same thing with your fingers and with your compression, um, and I would come a chromatic um, tetrachord because of the greater flexibility. So, so the transition from, a, from an enharmonic tetrachord um, with, with quarter tones at the bottom uh, to a chromatic tetrachord with semitones at the bottom really is a function of how flex, pitch flexible your reeds are. Um, that's how I understand it, at least, from coming at it as a, uh, from a, with a practical perspective. Um, so let's just try that. Okay, we'll try doing an enharmonic tetrachord um, and a, a diatonic tetrachord. Um, and so here again, we've got the, the basic framework. Um, I'm going to, to, to treat the, the low pipe as um, um, hupate and, uh, uh, and messe, with missing, lifting my middle finger to get messe. So there's my messy. And so the tetrachord that I want goes hupati, parupati, messy. Okay, that's not giving me, um, uh, 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 because that's going straight up to a tone, a tone above. Don't want that, I want a semitone above. So I'm doing that with a lip, all right? Perfectly doable. Okay, I can get that semitone lip bend uh, with these reeds. That's quite nice. Super! I'm in business. So in other words, um, I've, I've kind of got a semitone pitch window. I'm perfectly happy with that. That's lovely. A semitone pitch window. And I think that, that, that this gives me uh, that the kind of enharmonic space in terms of navigating uh, uh, this, this framework, ancient Greek tonal framework. Uh, uh, these reeds are completely compatible with the old style. The old style where you deliver an enharmonic uh, uh, a tetrachord rather than a chromatic one. Replace these reeds with the ones that I'm used to, <laughs> and you're in the chromatic space. So let's just check now on the... So that, that was the, the middle tetrachord, or the uh, um, uh, tetrachord on meson. Uh, I'm now going to move up to the, uh, um, to the conjunct tetrachord, so the one that, that, that is uh, uh, um, beside it, touches it. So the messer, the top note, of the middle tetrachord is the bottom note of the conjunct tetrachord, uh, tetrachord uh, uh, synemenon. Again, I've got a tone there and I don't want a tone. So 
So I'm getting that my semitone there, um, I'm totally on the lip bend. So there we are, I'm playing my um, my sort of ancient Greek uh, uh, um, tetrachord there. And, da di do de do de da so all three in that pucknon there my barry pucknon my meso pucknon and my oxy pucknon doing them all on the lip That's my meso pucknon. So, it's not quite ideal. Um, I'm thinking that this is more of a diatonic instrument, really. Okay. My, I, I think for playing the enharmonic style, you probably want a Hellenic aulos. Yeah. Uh, not a Greco-Roman instrument. Uh, but... Uh, so, we, 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 but you can do it, okay? It's possible. And if I go up to my dear's day of Manon, the disjunct tetrachord. Ah, okay, so now we do have that semitone there. There we go. So, messy, para messy. And, and then you got messy. And if you're going to the nete, your conjunct nete. Okay, so there's my conjunct tetrachord. Enharmonic. <laughs> and on up to uh, uh, um, up to Paramesse the fifth. Uh, but no, let's go. Let's. I'll do it from a unison. So Messe on um, on my low pipe. Middle finger for Messi. That works. Okay, possible. Possible. Um, and if I now do chromatic tetrachord. There's my chromatic, back to the enharmonic. That was enharmonic, and now diatonic. Or... <laughs> Depending on whether you want to do major or minor, you can do either. Just by thinking it, okay? It's a very subtle uh, change in, in what you actually do with the lip. So, here we are, Louvre Aulos. Louvre Aulos reads by Max Bloomberg, parented by Melinda. 
and Melinda Maxwell. And it's joyful. Really, really, really joyful. Uh, um, I'd like a pair of reeds like this. Um, I'm going to finish by putting on uh, some reed caps and just saying that these are actually, the, these, as far as I'm concerned, okay, these are what parent reads. They're the, they, these are the critical things and they require real love, care and attention in the making of them. Okay, don't toss them off. Don't, don't treat them as uh, annoying things that you kind of have to do. No, make them with love, care, attention. Make them first. Make your reed educators. Because they're the parents of your reeds. Okay, parents have an important role to play. They make a difference. And, and I'm, um, uh, 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 there's a difference between a reed protector and a, and, and a reed parent. Um, and so what, what I'm interested in um, is, is, is this uh, uh, shape here, beautiful shape. Um, um, and the parent of the reed uh, um, needs to operate um, on that top part of the blade. So, and, I have, and you know, when I put it on, I want to feel, it's got to feel gorgeous all the way. So I want it to, to as, as I push it on, I'm getting resistance the full way. And I don't ever, 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 ever want to see reed emerge from the top of a sheath. Okay, this is a sheath. It covers the blade, it protects the blade and it holds it tightly. The blades need protection. They're so delicate. Treat them like a $2,000 investment. Okay? Look after your blades. They are delicate. A good pair of reeds that's been well parented, you're talking about, you know, a hundred hours of highly skilled work. What's an hourly rate for a highly skilled person? That gives you the true value of a reed, one reed, and you've got two of them. And the thing is that you can't, you're not just doubling it because they've got a balance. So the true value of a balanced pair of Aulos reeds is not twice the uh, um, one reed, it's about 10 times one reed. Because the balance is so crucial to being able to deliver a, a prize winning performance at top level. So look after your reads, make, put, invest time and love into the parents. And, and, and the, the crucial thing is, is the shape. Um, I, uh, you know, we're, we're learning all the time. Uh, so I'm just sharing what I believe at the moment. And, and, and that's been a moving feast. Uh, uh, but certainly for the parents of reads, um, I'm going for parallel. I'm going for parallel both ends. So, so it's a parallel slit um, at, the, at the narrow end, at the tip end, and it's a parallel slit at the onion end. Okay, so the onion is this, this kind of fat bit down, down here, just above the, the constriction. I like to think of it as the belly. Okay, your reed has a waist and then a belly. Okay, a belly and a back, I suppose. You can think of the belly, maybe the belly sticks out a bit more, and some reeds lean forwards and some reeds lean back. Okay, they're all, they're all individuals. Real characters, reads. Um, and you want to get to know the personality and the characteristics of your individual. 